If you're like me, you might hear estate planning and go, ugh, gross. You might think to yourself, I'm not sure why I'd bother with that. Estate planning is only for the uber rich. Tall grass begs to differ. Tall grass founding attorneys Laurel and Riley think everyone should have an estate plan. They know estate planning seems untouchable to a lot of folks, like something you have to do inside a stuffy law firm of stuffy McLawyer Pants Esquire. But I promise you, Tallgrass is nothing like that. For one, they work out of their home so their clients can feel at home. They obsess, because they're nerds, over making clients feel like they belong and are supposed to be there. Also, their kids might make an appearance. They will take time to answer all of your questions, even the uncomfortable ones. They will work relentlessly to make sure your plan's exactly what you need to feel secure and at peace. So if you've been putting off planning for what's going to happen after you've gone, it's time for you to give Tallgrass a call at 918-770-8940 and start your plan today. Or visit their website at tallgrassestateplanning.com and schedule a free initial consultation. For free! It's right there on the website. And of course, there's more, because this is a podcast ad. If you tell them you're a Pot for Good listener, they're going to take 25% off their service fees. Just tell them Pot for Good sent you. Stop thinking estate planning isn't for you and give Tallgrass a call today at 918-770-8940 or on their website, which I'm not going to read out to you again. It's in our show notes. Thank you, Tallgrass. Welcome to another episode of Pod for Good, a podcast where we learn from those doing good in Tulsa, why they care, what we can do, and most importantly, what you can do. Pod for Good is produced and edited by Rant9 Productions, which is me, and can be found anywhere you get your podcasts. I'm your chief philanthropod, Jesse Ulrich. And I'm your vice admiral philanthropod, Chris Miller. And today, our guests are Andrew Spector, the co-director and founder of Tulsa Changemakers, and two fantastic changemakers themselves, Mariana and Emily. We talked to Mariana and Emily about their growth through Changemakers, the importance of youth voices, and how they were by far the most mature people in the room. That was 100% true. Enjoy, everybody. We are very excited to have Andrew Spector from Tulsa Changemakers on the podcast today. Andrew, hello. Hey, Jesse. Hey, Chris. Hello. And what is definitely... As I said earlier, the longest from idea to recording uh, podcast Pod for Good has ever done. We are very excited to talk about Changemakers on on Pod for Good. So let's get the sort of the the basic questions out of the way. Where did the idea for Tulsa Changemakers come from? Tulsa Changemakers is really the product of two experiences that myself and Jake Lerner, co-founder of Changemakers, had when we first moved to Tulsa through Teach for America. The first experience was just feeling incredibly welcome when we got here. I'm just super invested in and really connected as leaders right away in the community. For me, I moved here from outside of, well, moved here from Charleston, South Carolina, originally from outside of Boston, Jake from Philly. Um, it just felt amazing across the board to feel really welcomed and invested in as leaders. Uh, and the second experience we had was going into our classrooms. Obviously, first year teaching was challenging, but our students were just blowing us away every day. My sixth graders at Bell Elementary, Jake's fifth graders at Tulsa Legacy Charter School. Our students were bright. They were socially minded. They had leadership skills that rivaled adults that we knew. And we just became really struck by this juxtaposition between our experiences as outsiders, newcomers to Tulsa, um, and the experiences of the young people in our classrooms, the insiders. And what struck us the most is that for me and Jake, as outsiders and newcomers to Tulsa, we felt like we were being more invested in and more positioned as leaders in the community than the young people in our classrooms that are actually better positioned um, to drive positive impact in their schools and communities. And so the question Jake and I started asking ourselves is, what can we do to position the young people in our classrooms as young as 10 years old, and now for us as young as eight years old, uh, to drive positive impact in their schools and communities right now, and then in doing so, prepare them for lives of leadership in the future as well. So how did this go from idea to actuality? Well, we just started doing things. <laughs> we took a few students from my classroom, a few students from Jake's classroom. We got some funding from the George Kaiser Family Foundation and went to 36 Degrees North downtown for, for an afternoon. And we just kind of put together a workshop. We did some I worked on some, some key concepts in design thinking and leadership development and asset-based community development. And we did a root cause analysis. And one of my favorite stories from the day actually was uh, Michaela from my school and Autumn from Jake's school. They were both really frustrated with vandalism and graffiti in their schools and communities. And they thought a foundational cause 
or root cause of vandalism and graffiti was that people, particularly young people, didn't have enough places to publicly express themselves. And they thought a foundational solution was more public art spaces. And we're like, that's a really cool idea. <laughs> and it's like a really great assessment of the situation. But ultimately, that idea didn't actualize into action. And something that Jake and I talk about is this idea of breaking the light bulb. Like the light bulb, the idea is the easy part, but making it happen is hard. And over time, we did a number of workshops and without really getting where we wanted to, and we realized we needed a much more consistent development program to really support the young people in going from idea to action, which has manifested in what the program looks like now, where we partner with the school site to hire, train, and support a coach. And then that coach, typically a teacher, runs the after-school program, and it's a 25-session process. The curriculum is called Listen, Listen, Act. And they take the change makers through a process where they listen first to themselves, identify themselves as experts in their own experiences, this, identifying the strengths, challenges, and opportunities that they see in their schools and communities. Then the second listen is saying, hey, I'm an expert in my community, but I don't know everything about my community. So I'm going to go out and do some more listening. They do some one-on-one -on -one interviews and surveys. And then that intersection of those two phases of listening, they identify a topic and then a project. And then they plan, execute, and measure that impact project, and then ultimately share about it at a public pitch night in front of over 200 people. I, I have to say, like, for our listeners, these pitch nights are, they're just amazing. I very rarely come out of a thing like that as jazzed as I do when I go to the Changemakers, um, the pitch nights. They're, they're just fantastic. I don't know how to describe when you, when you see someone who, obviously, way younger than you, just get it. <laughs> and they're like, all right, like society's going to be okay. Tesla's going to be okay. <laughs> they're, they are receiving the training that like we all wish we would have had at their age. And it's just really fantastic. So if you get a chance to go to one of these, do it. That's yes. all. That's my pitch for that. <laughs> Your <laughs> pitch for pitch night? Yeah. My it, double pitch. It's a good opportunity to plug. We do have some pitch nights coming up. Yes. And we have our, we have a pitch night on May 6th. It's a union pitch night for five union elementary schools, 5.30 p.m. Facebook Live. Typically, pitch nights are in person. Um, we usually do them at TCC, McKeon Center for Creativity downtown. But of course, during this school year, we're doing them virtually. Um, so that's on May 6th. And we also have a pitch night coming up for Tulsa Public Schools on May 25th and May 26th, both at 5.30 p.m. on Facebook Live. Well, pretty soon we're going to get to the real stars of this podcast. But one of the things we do want to give you an opportunity, you plug the pitch nights, but what are the best ways that people can connect to Changemakers and, and help out if they want to? So our big vision with Tulsa Changemakers is uh, a future where Tulsa is a model city for youth-driven impact. And there's multiple ways that we see ourselves working towards that vision and really building, in, in the words of uh, the founder of the Mikva Challenge in, in, in Chicago, building the infrastructure for youth voice in, in Tulsa. And so there's a few ways to do that. One is through after-school program. So we, we think that it's important to achieve a certain level of saturation of our after-school program in Tulsa to really achieve that model city. And so if you're connected to a school in Tulsa Public or Union Public Schools that we're not currently at, please help us get it connected. Another way is that if you're nonprofit or you're working for a city or another institution that works with young people, we want to find ways to support you in creating uh, spaces for authentic youth adult partnership. And then also, we're just down to figure it out. So you can find us on, uh, on TulsaChangemakers.org reach out to me at andrew at leadershiptulsa.org and uh, we can find a way to get you plugged into the program. Very cool. Well, now we are going to uh, transition into a, a special phase of the podcast and we're going to interview two change makers. So and, I'm, I'm, andrew, would you like to do the introductions yes. for us and then we'll kick it over to them? Sure, I'll do it. So first I'll introduce Emily Lara. Emily is an alumna of Tulsa Changemakers. I believe she went through the program as a fall 2018 changemaker at Nathan L. High School. Since then, she's participated in the Tulsa Public School Superintendent Student Cabinet. She's also our first Tulsa Changemakers intern. And she's also the salutatorian of uh, her high school class, 2021. You can fill in anything that I'm missing, Emily, but you've been an amazing and inspirational changemaker for us. So I'm really excited to, for you to talk today. Should I also introduce yeah, Mariana? Yeah. And Mariana Aguirre, I'm really excited to introduce you as well. You were in the COVID class of spring 2019, or yeah, spring 2020, Changemakers. 
And then you came back again for fall 2020. Immediately after spring 2020, um, you got involved with the, the advisory committee. You've been a host of Pitch Night last semester and just continuing to, to rock it and change makers. And you're currently an eighth grader at Tulsa Otter Academy Middle School. And really excited for you to be here too. Mariana, hello. Thank you for joining us today. My first question would be, well, we'll get to the COVID part of going through Changemakers later, but what was like the thing that you think about most that you got out of the Changemakers experience? I think for me, it was um, building like new connections with people and relationships that I wouldn't have, like I wouldn't have met half of these people if I weren't going through Changemakers. So just like just meeting new and different people. Very cool. So uh, you went through the program twice, correct? Both spring and fall? Yeah. So did you do two different projects? Yeah. At first we started something like a project around like the environment and we were going to build a community garden. Mm -hmm. But um, during the summer, I spent a lot of time on social media and I realized how big of a problem human trafficking was and how no one spoke about it in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anyone had had a project about it in Tulsa Changemakers. And I came in and I was telling my cohort, I was like, this is something we need to talk about. Mm -hmm. We need, there's needs to, there needs to be more attention Mm -hmm. to it. And I mean, they loved the idea. I loved it. So we started working with that. Was it like an awareness campaign or was it a, what were you trying to do to help stop human trafficking? So we worked with organization here in Tulsa they're the demand project and we raise money towards their new camp to help victims. And we also had a couple lessons to teach our students about warnings and things they can do to prevent human trafficking. I don't think people know that Tulsa is a huge hub for human trafficking because of uh, its vicinity to highways that go across the entire country. So like Tulsa and Oklahoma city, Oklahoma city, especially because I 40 goes all the way each direction. We are, Oklahoma is like two tiny hubs on the sort of human trafficking path. That's amazing. Emily, so you are a couple of years removed from the change maker experience. You're now their first intern. Looking back on it now, what was that most important memory, but the thing that stuck with you the most about your change maker's experience? The experiences I got uh, because I'm an English learner student. So uh, Tulsa change makers helped me express myself more and like uh, open more to like the new world and everything, you know, like knowing like new stuff and like talking to other people because I was really shy about talking to um, new people because I was scared of like messing up and stuff like that. So yeah, I think one of the most, one of the best uh, experiences I got with Tulsa Changemakers was opening myself more to the new world and to new people and everything like that. So, yeah. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about your project from Changemakers? Whenever I was told about Changemakers, I was really, really interested about it, like immediately, because um, in my personal experience, I've, I've experienced a lot of racism and discrimination and stuff like that because of being a Hispanic. So... Whenever I first moved here, I experienced a lot of racism, discrimination, bullying, and stuff like that. So the first thing that came up to my mind was, this is my opportunity to change this, you know, to make an impact in my school, especially, so I can, like, do something about it, you know? So I started talking to my cohort about um, discrimination and bullying and stuff like that. So they were like, yeah, because... They were all his, Hispanic, so they kind of, like, knew about everything that was going on and stuff. Um, so we decided to do a cultural diversity night at my school. So what we did was um, we raised money. We, um, we asked people to fundraise, and we went out there and talked to a lot of so we went out there and then we started 
uh, telling everyone about it. And they were like, okay, I'm willing to help you, you know. And then they started giving us like some restaurants that were willing to help us and stuff. Um, so what we basically did was we asked some restaurants to donate food um, so we could have like a lot of different kinds of food like from different places so students can have the time to like you know try new things and then we had a lot of art too in the in the cultural diversity night and we also had different types of dances from different cultures and um i think one of the best things that was for the students was the food because they were like this is amazing. I didn't know this was from Mexico. Or I didn't know this was from um, Honduras. I didn't know this, you know, stuff like that. So it was like really, really fun. And it was like we wanted to make it fun so students could be more interested in it. And we actually, our goal was to meet 100 people, to get 100 pe people to go there. We did had like 100 and something the first time. So um, we decided to do it. Again, to do it a tradition. So um, our staff, they loved it. Everyone loved it. So they wanted it to be a tradition afterwards. So whenever um, our principal talked to us, she was like, you, you know, I have never seen this many students engaging in one thing, you know. And they loved it. And then we decided to make a survey. So to see, we decided to make a survey to see how we could improve it. Um, a lot of students were like, oh, yeah, you need to get more dances, like different types of dances, more art, more food and everything like that. So um, whenever we did it the second time, we actually met our second goal. So it was like to have more than 150 people in there. So what we liked about that was that a lot of students were taking the time to actually try new things and try to like difference what culture was which and you know. So yeah, that was that was our project. It was a cultural diversity night and it was like really fun and engaging and everything. So earlier I made my pitch for the pitch nights. And so I want to hear both of your experiences about what that pitch night those pitch nights were like. I know yours was probably in person and yours probably was not. So those are different, obviously. But was that like the first time you had to like speak in front of a large group of people? Yes, it was. Um, I was actually really nervous. I was getting sick like five minutes before and everything because there was a lot of people in there. <laughs> I mean, I still get nervous talking in front of people. It is it's something that everybody feels and you just like you slowly develop strategies for, you know, how you do it. I just, I just pretend no one's in the room, so. What we did was we tried to make it half and half, so we did it bilingual. So two, two of our girls did it in English and two of us did it in Spanish. It was, it was a really, it was a really great experience. Um, and since there, like, since then, I've been, like, it has helped me a lot to communicate with other people. Because I was like, if I could communicate in front of a lot of people, I can like do it. You know. How about you? I mean, for me, all I had to hit record <laughs> on Zoom. So it was like pretty easy. There was nothing to be nervous about. I mean, it was just the same people in my group and it was going to be sent to Jake and Andrew and they were going to edit it in. But it was my first time speaking in Spanish, like recording and, and in school just in general. So I was pretty nervous about that because I mean, there's always like, Oh, what if I sound bad? But I didn't. I, a lot of people said I sounded pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so what, there weren't any nerves knowing that, you know, a lot of, a lot of people might view, might, might see your video. You were you able to separate the, you know, what you were doing while you were recording versus who would actually see the video. I thought about it at first and I was like, I'm not going to think about this. This is just going to make me nervous. And mm -hmm. I was like, I'm just going to forget about it. I'm just going to hit record. Whoever sees it, hopefully they like it. They don't. Well, I'm glad I'm not there looking at their faces. So you're not thinking about the fact that it's going to be on the internet forever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's still on there. <laughs> uh, so one of the things that Andrew talked about was that a big foundational part of this program is listening, both to yourself, listening to the community. So 
was that a skill that you built up as part of this program or was it something you already had and sort of tapped into? I think both. I feel like change makers helped me like a lot, but um, before I already had that skill. Yeah, for me, um, I feel like I had kind of it, but not really a lot of it because I wasn't really engaging with a lot of people at that time because of my my language, you know. Um, so that really helped me a lot to develop my um, listening skills because I really got to listen to myself first. That was the first uh, the first thing that came up to my mind, you know. Um, what would you like to change? You know, what would you like to make an impact on? So I was, um, I was like, okay, if I want to do this, I'm going to listen to others to see what they think about it, you know. Um, so that's whenever it came up, that's whenever the time came up to like listen to my cohort. And then we made the surveys to listen to other students. And they said that there was a lot of uh, racism and discrimination and stuff like that around the school. So yeah, it really helped me develop my listening skills. So it's obviously, it as Andrew talked about, it's it can be very difficult. I mean, you can have the greatest idea in the world, but but turning that into a reality. So what was the hardest part for you of turning, of, of taking your idea of a diversity night and then making it a reality? For me, I think it was all the stuff that we had to gather up. So we had to like gather up food, um, art and everything like that. And we didn't have a lot of time. So we had to, um, that was actually another another skill that I developed with Tulsa Change Maker was time management because I had like this this amount of time to to be able to to be able to make a lot of stuff, you know, like to gather up food, gather up the art, gather up the 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 groups of people that were gonna dance and like yeah, a lot of information. I think um, that was the worst, the most difficult thing that I that I experienced there as a whole because, like, we had a lot of help, but still it was, like, our responsibility to get it done by a certain amount of time. So, Mariana, for you, what was your most difficult part? I mean, having to do everything virtually is super hard. I mean, when you have to talk to someone, it has to be now through email. You can't really meet face to face with a certain organization or this person that can help you with your project. It all has to be online and it takes a lot of patience, too. And it was just super stressful. Yeah, I can imagine that's something that we've all had to deal with and tried to try to adapt. It being, you know, you having to go through a virtual environment for this program. um, Do you do you feel like that? you got a lot of value going through the program, even knowing that it was a virtual environment, the change makers program. Yeah. Um, I mean, I still learned so much from it and I would do it again if they gave me the option to, <laughs> but I think it also helped that I had, um, already met my coach and had a relationship with her since I had part of my semester before in person. So it's probably a little different from other people's um, experiences doing it virtually. What is a skill that you have now that you didn't even realize was a skill before you, you went through the change makers program? Probably like public speaking. I was super shy before this. And now, I mean, I was like a complete introvert. I talked to no one. I had no friends. I get out of, I finished my change maker semester and now I'm like a whole different person. I'm much more like well, I'm an extrovert. I talk with a bunch of people. I have new <laughs> friends. I'm not afraid to speak. And that's like, I mean, not what I would have thought of that I would have gotten out of change makers. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're talking on a podcast right now. So. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I think it was uh, public speaking too. And my social skills, um, because I was really shy too, because of the same thing, um, because of my language. And yeah, as a whole, I think it was mostly public speaking because that was just crazy to see how I was able to speak in front of a lot of people and like not be nervous. Like at that point, you know, I was just like letting things flow. And yeah, so it was 
it was a really good experience. Well, and I don't know if I'd call it a skill, but it seems like both of you gained a lot of self-confidence going through this and in, in being who you are and, and understanding who you are. Yeah, definitely. So since we um, have a- Andrew in the room and to make this as awkward as possible. So if there was something that um, you could have done differently or changed about change makers, what would that be? I mean, I'm guessing for you doing it in person, but, <laughs> but other than being able to do it in person, what's something that you would have changed about your experience in change makers? I mean, I would have liked to do it for longer, maybe a whole year, but obviously that's um, not giving the opportunity out to everyone. I can't really think of anything. <laughs> I just like, I like it. I, I, I have some really, really positive um, thoughts about tools of change makers. I really like it as a whole, like everything, everything of it. I, I love it. I love, I, I love the, I love the idea of like, yeah, I guess, like, I love the idea to, like, como me gusta la idea de, de ver, um, de ver a tan, de ver la oportunidad que tienen tantos estudiantes de entrar sus a change makers y poder hacer un impacto en la comunidad. She likes the idea that, um, Tulsa Change Makers gives you the opportunity to, like, work and make an impact in your community. So now that you're kind of on the other side of things, as a intern for change makers. So what have you seen from from that side of things and and how have you liked that experience? I really like the experience to help them, you know, get um some things ready for the Tulsa change makers right now. It's been a really 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 great experience because I've I've learned a lot of new skills uh, as an intern that I I guess missed being a change maker like the perspective more of being more responsible for other things you know i like that if i get to choose to be a change maker or an intern i would choose being an intern because i i i like the responsibility i like the feeling of the fact that i'm being responsible for a lot of stuff that are that i know that are going to help the change makers so yeah i really like i really like to be an intern what did that change about where you think your life is going and what you want to do once you finish school and you were out in the world? So like before change makers, I had no idea really what I wanted to do for like in the future and go to college. And, um, I was thinking about it. Um, now I would want to be something like a congresswoman, something, someone that makes a change, someone that can help not just like be there. Well, I mean, no one's just there, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some but, people are just there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's like a, it brought me bigger dreams and like more ambition. So you want to be a, an, an adult change maker, is what you're saying? Yeah, yeah I want to be an adult <laughs> change maker. There you go. I like it. Tagline. Yeah, um, for me, I think it made me so like it made me see the world in a different perspective. Um, before I didn't really know much about like the problems that we have in the community or school or you know um, yeah I feel like it really really helped me see the world in a different perspective and it really helped me like like Mariana was saying um, to see myself as someone in the future that is going to help someone else that it's always going to be there for someone else to help so yeah it it has it has um it has brought me a lot of courage a lot of courage to help others i totally agree there's like issues that you hear about on tv but it's until you come to change makers and you talk with people and you're like oh those happen in tulsa too it's not just something that happens though in california texas it's something that happens worldwide, but you just don't hear about it. So the majority of our audience, probably all of our audience, are, are adults, right? What would you tell them is the most important thing they could do to not just help the, the two of you, but to help young leaders in general? What is it that adults do that annoys you the most? <laughs> not listen and not take it seriously. I totally agree because some adults think that just because of the fact that we are young, we don't have the capability of doing 
something big, doing an, an impact or like thinking critically about um, problems in the community or school. So I, I, I agree with, uh, with um, Mariana 100%. Uh, some adults don't listen or don't even care about young leaders. I mean, being young, it's a whole different perspective from how mm -hmm. you're seeing like some issues. We see them in a whole other way. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that I noticed when I went into the first, when I watched the first uh, pitch night, I remember thinking, wow, I was blown away by how professional everything is, how well thought out, well researched. But then I had to, to sit back and, sec and think about that was kind of my own bias. And that's the type of thing you kids deal with a lot is adults that don't expect enough from them. And I feel like that's one of the powers of change makers is that not just that they, you know, empower youth, but they expect great things from young people. And that's th something that I think a lot of adults don't do. They assume that you don't know enough, that you can't do enough. And so that seems like something that's really valuable in this program. So Jesse, expect more from people. All right. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, again, <laughs> those pitch nights just cut through all of the sort of negative pessimism that can build up in you over time. You're like, all right, like, like these, these students are putting like all the energy that I could be putting into complaining about something into actually fixing it. And so maybe I should stop complaining and work on it, you know? And I, as, as I imagine both of you have come to understand, there are some problems that can seem too big and you don't know where to start. Right. But the most important thing is to at least start mm -hmm. to do something instead of just being like, well, I can't fix it myself. So right. I shouldn't do anything. I mean, I can't fix racism. I can't fix human trafficking, but I can teach people some people in my community about it, I can advocate and maybe one day we'll all be advocating and talking about it to the point where we actually like fix that problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good example because both of you tackled massive issues that are hard to move the needle on, but you both picked, you know, something smaller and tangible that you could make a difference with. Yes. Yes. Um, in my experience, I will. I knew that I wasn't gonna um, that I wasn't gonna be able to change it worldwide or something like that. But you know, you know how um, small steps at a time they will get you through. They will get you to your your goal. And yeah, that's one of um, one of the things I learned too. Um, taking small steps at a time to get through um, my goal. And Mariana, you used partnerships with, you know, existing agencies that were tackling the same issue, which is also an important skill to have. So what was it like, I guess, find, seeking out other organizations that, you know, were tackling this issue and then building a relationship with them? So we went online and we were like, human trafficking organizations Tulsa on Google, <laughs> right? We emailed a bunch. Some didn't have time to help us, which is totally fine because they're super busy. Um, and the demand project had lots of interest with helping us. And I mean, super difficult doing it online and all that shenanigans, <laughs> <laughs> like, but I think just like having meetings with the people talking, planning everything out was super like helpful, super good. And I think now I'm connected to the, the demand project. People in my school are connected to the demand project and I know that I mean, I didn't even know that there was human trafficking organizations in Tulsa, but now I do. And I know where to go when I have a question or basically anything. Well, uh, keep a lookout for, it's like, it's going to be an actual facility. It's going to be called the Francine house, which is going to be like a, uh, a place for people trying to escape human trafficking where they can like sort of put their lives back together. It's currently in the fundraising phase. So I'm doing some, some work with that organization and, yeah, it's just one of those things like you just have to do something and the, the majority of people do, don't know that it's a problem. So to our listeners, human trafficking is a problem. So just to clear that up. Jesse, it sounds like you could be a change maker. I could. Listen, I'd be a great change maker. <laughs> <laughs> what would, what would uh, both of you say to young people that want to get involved, want to make a difference? How would you advise them? I think just don't think about other people's opinion. Your idea might seem a little crazy. But it truly isn't. Everything here is normal. We can do something out of it. It's just you speaking up. 
Yes, um, I would say kind of the same thing as um, Mariana. Just don't be afraid to speak up because that's one of the most big problems in the school for young people. They're just really afraid to speak up and to like get their thoughts out there because they think that people are just going to judge them. And yeah, like Mariana said, um, just if someone's making a negative comment to you, just ignore them. You know, that's the best thing. That's the best thing to do. Just ignore them because there's always, always going to be someone that is willing to help you. So yeah, that's, that would be my advice, just to not be afraid to speak up. Yeah, sometimes people make negative comments because your voice is so powerful and they're afraid of what you're saying, of of you. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I know when I um, went to the first pitch night, I think one of the reasons I was blown away was because people were saying things and showing understanding of things I didn't learn until I was, you know, in my late 20s, early 30s. So I think you will always run into people who the way they deal with that sort of jealousy or is, is trying to silence people. So, yeah, I think it's really important what you both said about speaking up. Seriously, like from deep in my heart, thank you both for talking with us today. Like I know you have much more important things to do, but like (laughs) hearing your stories, I know like make, it makes me feel more optimistic about the world in the future. So we, we do like to finish with at least one fun question. So since we're all in a room together and not at, at Jesse's studio, we'll, uh, we'll use our backup. All right. Which one's that? It's been a crazy year for everyone. So just what have, what have you been doing to sort of unwind and have fun when you're trying to get away from everything going on? The way that I get um, my mind uh, out of the real world, I guess, uh, is like by playing soccer and by... Um, Hanging out with my friends. Um, I love drawing, so drawing and dancing. I love dancing too and singing. I don't sing that good. I just sing in the shower, you know, but <laughs> I love doing those kind of stuff, like fun stuff. So, yeah, um, it's been a really rough year, but for me, it's listening to music or um, I'm part of a swim team and that just like super fun gets. Me, um, I mean, all day, all you hear about is COVID. You're wearing a mask, something. And all you do is get stressed out. And those things just, like, help me wind down and be a little more calm. Two water-related activities we heard. Yeah. So, singing in the shower and swimming. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That feels very appropriate as we're moving into the, the hot part of the Oklahoma year. So, <laughs> yeah. we've gone past the warm part and now moving towards the hot Anyway, that's my little Oklahoma weather time report. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Not that it means anything, but I know that Chris and I both wish you both like just massive success. Yeah. And, you know, and we are thankful that the Changemakers program exists here in Tulsa. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you guys for this opportunity. Uh, we're really glad. Um, I'm pretty sure Mariana is too. <laughs> um, to get our voice to be heard one more time uh, for the adults and young people. So thank you guys a lot for this opportunity. Well, I doubt it'll be the last time. Yeah, once once adults, you're both, voice. and once you're both, uh, you know, senators or or congress, you know, people or president or whatever, we'll have you back on. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll be happy to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for listening to our conversation with Andrew, Mariana, and Emily. And if you're listening to this episode on the day it comes out, May 6th, they have a Changemakers pitch night tonight. Uh, You can watch it on Facebook, on their Facebook page, and they have another one on May 25th and May 26th. Speaking of the internet, please follow Pod for Good on Facebook, on Instagram, and the Twitter. And of course, please subscribe and leave a review if you can, because again, we will read it on air, unedited. No one has taken us up on this offer. I'm very disappointed. As always, Tulsa, get it done. Broken Arrow, you know where you can stick it. And even though the mandate's gone, the store wants you to wear a mask. Wear a mask. Wear a mask.